Hello and welcome to Save Time and Money Using Telemetry for Stormwater Monitoring. This is your presenter, Angel Luke. I'm the Sampler Product Line Manager for Teledyne ISCO. I have about 20 years of experience with water and wastewater monitoring equipment, which includes installations, to, uh, troubleshooting, um, technical support, even application support. I've done all this over the, over the years. We're going to talk a little bit about um, stormwater monitoring, but especially we're going to talk about telemetry. So as you can see here, these are the basic components of a stormwater monitoring system. You could take all of these or just pieces and parts of these, or you can also add some other pieces to it. They could include an automatic sampler, a level indicator, different types of flow meters, rain gauges, sensors that actually monitor real-time data, different types of enclosures, and there's many different types of telemetry out there. Here's an example of a monitoring site which includes solar panel charger with a deep cycle marine battery, an automatic sampler. This one here in this picture is a portable sampler, so then it does not refrigerate the samples. A weatherproof enclosure, in this case, this was just one that was purchased from one of the big um, uh, warehouse. And then there's an analog modem. Now, these days we don't use analog modems, but back when this installation um, happened, analog modem was all that was available. This was actually in an airport, and they were monitoring the runoff of the runways. Here's another application. This is a settling pond, where you can see they have a portable refrigerated sampler that runs off of a battery and they've added a rain gauge versus not having a rain gauge in the last slide. Here you can see the deep cycle marine battery and there's a solar panel charger and then you have a weatherproof enclosure that's made out of fiberglass that is designed for this type of application and in also a digital cellular modem. This is another application where this is a field as you can see, there's no runoff right now. This is a dry pond. Um, down in the lower corner here next to the sampler, there, that's where the water flows in. And you see here, they mounted the cellular modem onto a pole, and that's where the antenna was mounted. In this case, it is also another digital cellular modem. Here's an application of an agricultural runoff field. They channeled it around so then all of the runoff would come out of these H flumes. So this is where they've added a bubbler flow meter. As you can see, the bubbler flow meter is connected up to the H flume so then you can monitor the flow. Also connected up to it is the automatic sampler, which is triggered by the flow meter. The storm would happen, it would run off the field. As soon as the bubber flow meter gets that level, it notices that the water rises, it activates the sampler so the sampler can start taking samples. They use an H flume in this case because the water flow is very slow and, um, and very low. In this case, they can get some pretty good accuracy at the really low levels. In this application, they have a depth measurement device. This is a pond, which actually is from a livestock uh, facility. They have fields and out there and pastures where they have um, uh, cows that are out there. there um, it flows into one pond and then into another. This is an application in a park where they're monitoring the runoff. So this is a stormwater outfall where they've added a flow meter in here inside the culvert. And then they've also mounted the strainer. And this is a closed system. So this is a wastewater treatment system. Um, we're seeing a lot of those more these days where they have these little package treatment systems. And then they have like a stainless steel enclosure connected up to it, which includes the sampler and the flow meter in there. 
This is a unique application. Um, this is where they use the GOES satellite system. And you can see here, this is the antenna, so it's quite a bit different than the cellular antennas that we saw earlier. This is an example of what a satellite system could look like. This is one for like weather and for water monitoring. And GO Satellite is a geostationary satellite server that is run by the U.S. National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service. It's a free satellite service for government agencies. They've done some expansions now where it actually, uh, can be used not just by federal government agencies, but also state and possibly even municipal. Um, the modems can be purchased from several different entities. There are several manufacturers that make the GOES modems, and then the satellite service itself is free. This system is a spread spectrum radio. Um, in this case, it's unlicensed. There is no external antenna in this system. It's actually mounted in the blue box on the dash there. This will allow you to download data directly from your vehicle from a long, actually a fairly long ways away, depending on how many obstacles are in the way. Spread, uh, like I said, spread spectrum radio is unlicensed, so that means you don't have to pay for the service. It's free. You purchase the modems themselves. You have a receiver and a transceiver. So you have one that's located at the remote site, and then you have one that's located next to you when you're downloading the data. They are for short distances. Rule of, good rule of thumb, if you have good line of sight, you can go about a mile. If you do not have good line of sight, because maybe the um, equipment is down inside of a manhole and needs to go through a manhole cover, you can get maybe about a block. In this uh, application here, they're using a web-based cellular modem. This is also a digital modem, but I'm going to go in a little bit more detail about that later. But uh, the other system that I showed you is not a web-based cellular modem. So telemetry can be used in lots of different op applications. Um, in this case, we're talking about stormwater runoff monitoring but it also relates to other different applications like agricultural runoff. I showed some, um, some photos of that, but also your wastewater collection systems where they're actually in manholes or in large wastewater treatment plants where they want the data either immediately or they don't want to have to go out to download the data. Um, some industries like airports and uh, large manufacturing facilities have many different discharge points throughout their facility and it, this makes it very convenient that they don't have to go out there and download the data uh, manually on the site. They can actually just download all the data right from their computer. And pump stations. Uh, we see telemetry used in pump stations quite often for um, letting people know or letting them know when they're actually running the pump stations. As I said earlier, there are many different types of telemetry. Um, I just want to go through a little bit of details on this. I don't want to dwell too much on the actual um, mechanics of it all. But there are cellular modems out there. Um, as I said before, analog modems are no longer used. They're all digital modems. There are two basic types of cellular modems. It's CDMA and GSM. On the CDMA platform, that's the one that's used most often here in the United States, um, where you're going to see provider, service providers like Verizon and GSM would be like AT&T. They're two different types of services. Um, CDMA also offers, offers a service called 1XRTT, which is for push data, and for GSM it's GPRS, which is also push data. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a little bit, so I won't go into detail on it now. As I mentioned earlier, there are diff two different types of radio. There's license and unlicensed. The license radio is something that you pay as the data is actually going through. In those cases, if you're going over long distances, you may need several repeaters actually stationed in different areas, especially if you're going over hills or if you have valleys or something like that. You're going to have repeaters in place um, to extend the length of uh, from transmission. 
Unlicensed would be things like um, the spread spectrum radio I talked about. But then there's also like Bluetooth, something that you would use for like your phone. Most computers these days have Bluetooth. Um, Wi-Fi also um, is uh, used in really quite often. And uh, there's also a service called Zigbee, which is more of a commercial type of service. There's different types of satellite. I mentioned GOES, but there's other types of satellite services out there. There is um, the Orbcom system, which is a uh, low Earth orbiting satellites. And then there are the more, um, uh, that's more prevalent out there, where there are actual specific satellites that are set out there. They're not in the low Earth orbiting um, area, but uh, the, you have to position your antennas a little bit differently towards specific satellite themselves. Um, those also can be a costly service. Or you can do a combination of one or more. Um, you could use like an unlicensed radio to get you to a specific area. Um, in some cases like a manhole, you could go from a manhole to a pole that's located next to the road. And then from there, you could use licensed radio or cellular or satellite, any one of those other types of systems. So there is the capability of using more than one combination of all of this type of telemetry. So a basic telemetry system would include some type of wireless modem, depending on what you're using. It could be a digital modem or a, a digital cellular modem or a radio modem. But then on the other end, you need something to actually connect to it. So that could be a modem connected up to your computer, or it could be internet, could be all set up on the internet where you can get to it through your browser, or possibly even a smartphone. Uh, your smartphone would use either connect up to it using possibly um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or even the internet. And then you have to have some kind of software and there are two different types of software, the proprietary and non-proprietary software. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those. So here's some examples of two different types of digital cellular modem packages. The blue box here is a web-based cellular modem package. And then the other one is a just a digital cellular modem. It's a basic telemetry system. The sampler or data logger or flow meter, whatever piece of equipment you have out there, connects up to the cellular modem. And the cellular modem connects up to either your PC or your smartphone or your iPad or something like that. It sends the data that way. And this could also include not just retrieving the data, sending it out there, but it could be like an email or a text message. And then to download the data, what happens here is that the modem connects up to the sampler or the flow meter or the data logger, whatever you have out in the field, and then the computer connect up directly to it. In those cases, you can use that to cha make changes in your programming, to um, send out uh, signals to start a program or stop a program. So this is actually the computer talking to the, to the equipment out in the field through the cellular system. This is an example of proprietary software. As you can see in this screen, you get some real-time data. But then as you can see at the bottom, you could retrieve the data. You can get like the, all of the data that's actually inside of your equipment out in the field. It, this actually will allow you to see whether or not you have a qualified event but it also lets you know that everything's working properly. And this is an example of a non-proprietary software, something like HyperTerminal or PTerm or uh, TerraTerm. This is more of an open protocol where you connect up to the equipment. And then in this case, like you can see, there's a menu on different things that you can do. Um, you can um, do a screen dump, and that would allow you to see exactly what your equipment actually is doing where control allows you to take control of the keypad itself to make changes to the programming. Here's an example where not only can you just take control and make changes, but you can actually activate it to take a grab sample whenever you'd want it. 
but you could also activate a specific program or even disable the program. Using the text messaging or the SMS messaging, you could also connect up one master unit that would connect up to a cellular modem and then it would send a text message to equipment out in the field. So everything actually starts at the same time. So the site one would have the equipment that triggers it to start taking its sample, letting it know that a specific condition has occurred. And then it actually goes out and sends the text message to the other equipment and tells it to start its programming. Then there's the web-based telemetry system. And in this case, where the equipment connects up to the web-based modem, that modem itself can be connected up to the Internet, the World Wide Web, your PC, or it can also send emails or text messages. So you can get all the data through that way. So it actually pushes the data out instead of you calling up the equipment from your PC and downloading the data. This actually automatically sends data through the modem out to a web server, but you also have a web server that can send out text messages and emails. So this internet-based communications allows you to communicate to your site the other direction, like I said. So not only can you get to the internet and then get the data through the internet just from your browser, you can also use a web server where you can have several different terminals connected up to the web server and to get the data there, where you can actually do some data management. Not only just look at the data, but you can actually create complex graphs and tables, um, do some editing, things like that. So here's an example of a web interface. So then you go out to a web browser, you take a look, and you just get basic information. You can view the graph, you can um, look at a, at a line graph or a scatter graph in this case, and just see what's going on. This is really nice if you're sitting at home and a storm event happens, someone calls you, you get a text message saying, okay, it's time. You can just go up to the web server right from your home, log in, and take a look and see what's going on. If you're inside the network, inside the server itself, it actually goes to the server and grabs the data. And this here, you can get more complex information, and you can do a lot more manipulation of the data where you can edit the data if necessary. You can actually compare one site to another. Um, you can uh, put several different types of parameters out on the display so you can look at the graph or a table. You can also set up schedules from here where it will automatically export it or print it off if you want to look at it as a print or export it and put it inside of another type of a report. So if you're going to use an internet-based app um, system, you're inside the network, you're going to have firewall protection. So there's, a, uh, there's no way that no, anyone could come in here and take your data um, or actually look at your data or even go in through your web server and get to your information that you have on your web server. Where with the web interface, like I said before, if you go out to the browser, it is also password protected. You have to put in a password so you can access your data, and that way nobody else can just go out there and just look at your data. So I just explained all these different types of telemetry, but one thing is, is what can it do for me? Well, first of all, if you don't have to go out to the site in the middle of the storm, you can keep your workers from um, safe. You know, if the water rises or there's lightning strikes or anything like that, um, I know I don't want to be out there in the middle of a storm. It's not, uh, it's no fun. Uh, so you can keep them safe and out of the storm. You can reduce the amount of site visits. If you're receiving alerts letting you know that your sampling is triggered, then you can go online and take a look and see what's going on. Um, you don't need to be out there checking it out all the time. And then it can let you know when your sampling is complete, so that way you can get your crews together to go out there to retrieve the bottles. Also, let's say you do get a trigger and you go online, you take a look, and it's a false trigger. 
That could be an issue too. Let's say that for some reason um, you end up with a little something that goes inside of the um, rain gauge itself. They have like a mesh that go over the top, but sometimes things can get through there. And if that actually is heavy enough to act activate the program to say, let's start sampling, but it was a false event, then you're not going to want to take samples because then you just wasted those bottles. So you could go out there and take a look and see what's going on. Okay, you have a rain event, but then you see that your water level hasn't increased. So you can disable the sampling right then and there. You can also enable the sampling remotely. So let's say that um, you're, you're out in the field, you're driving around, you're doing some other things, and all of a sudden you see that a storm is starting to come in. Well, you can actually use your smartphone to send it a message and say it's time for you to start. You can have your equipment just sitting out there waiting to be activated. You don't have to wait, uh, depend on the other equipment to tell it it's time to activate. So in case some other sa um, sensors fail, let's say that you call it up and find out, okay, there's a storm going on, but your rain gauge wasn't located in the right place to detect that there was a storm. Then you can go ahead and enable the uh, sampler anyways. And using these type of uh, features, you reduce the amount of missed storm events that you have. In some, well, actually a large part of the U.S., we haven't had too much storm or too much rain lately. So if you're required to sample X amount of storm events each year, you probably want to make sure that you maximize the amount of sample events that you have. You want to make sure that you get data from all of them. So you can enable the sample remotely. You can change the sample frequency based on the storm event. I don't know how many times I've heard from customers where um, they program it for a medium-sized storm and then a large storm comes through that lasts a long period of time, but the sampler stops sampling in the middle of it instead of at the end, instead of waiting until the very end. Or so then you don't have the whole sampling event. So you can actually change the pacing um, or the frequency that it ta that it samples based on how big of a storm event you're going to have. You can also, like I said, you can access your data from your home because I know that most storms don't happen during work hours. Now, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's great when they do, but sometimes they don't. And in those cases, you know, if you're it's on the weekend, you don't have to go into the office. If you've got a computer at home, you can go into the internet-based browser and you can get on there, you can look and see what's going on. And if you know that there's an event, then maybe you can call all your crew, get them ready to go out there and uh, pull the samples. Another nice thing about using the web-based modems is that you can get alerts from the web server itself. The advantage of this is if you have a power failure out in the field, the modem out in the field doesn't know or can't actually send you an alert. But if the web server itself goes out there and takes a look and says, are you talking to me? Well, how come you're not talking to me? And then it says, okay, so it's been too long. They can send you an alert. Those alerts can come into email messages or text messages. So not only if it's power failure, maybe even the communication fails. Um, for some reason, you're not getting any communication. You still have the web server that can send you alerts. You can also get alerts um, when the, you have parameter readings that are out of range. If you have these in situ type of uh, sensors that are out there, you can have it contact you when you have like a low DO or a high pH or a high turbidity. Um, if you're seeing a spike in something, you can have it contact you. These may not be parameters that you're triggering your sampler on, but they might be things that you might be interested in. Um, it might be that uh, you want to take, go out there and take a grab sample or something like that, or you want to actually start taking samples or actually take samples more frequently, as in samples of readings, not samples in physical samples. So you can have these alerts that can come out to you. Another thing is, is that you can have equipment upstream trigger your equipment downstream. So then you can make sure that all of your equipment is monitoring at the same time, which could be a really nice plus. 
So in summary, telemetry can save you time by reducing the number of site visits and with the ability to enable and disable your sample remotely, to change the sample program remotely, to adjust for the size of the storm so you don't miss an event, and it'll send you alerts when an event is started and or it was completed. So then you know it's time to go out there to pick up the samples. Also, um, it can save you money. With reduced number of site visits, you don't have to spend the money on gas or the labor to get out there. And to reduce the amount of missed samples, storm events. If you miss them, that can cause you fines and it cause you issues. Um, that's how it can save you money. Here's my contact information if you have any questions. I appreciate your time. If you'd like more information on our equipment that we have to offer here at ISCO, please visit our website at www.isco.com. Thank you.